John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. I've been pretty upset recently, pretty disillusioned with things. I got some news recently that's had me very angry, and I figured that I could probably tie it into a broader issue that affects the whole country, especially because we've actually covered this story before in a separate video from about six months ago. So bear with me because it is story time. But if you've been here a while, you might remember that my mom was robbed at gunpoint in Detroit back in the fall of 2018, and I did a video about it a few months after it happened because I wanted to use it as a way to demonstrate the importance importance of situational awareness, taking responsibility for your safety, stuff like that. So in case you don't remember or you didn't watch the video, uh, she and one of her friends were walking back to their car when a black luxury sedan pulled up and asked them for directions. And now my mom said that she felt like something was wrong. So she just said that she didn't know. And then she kept walking to her car, probably because she's racist, right? So this guy gets out of the car. Well, no, it parks behind them. And then this guy gets out of the car and then he pulls a gun on them and he starts to run after them, yelling at them to drop their purses. And you can actually see in the video that he, well, that's the other thing. Um, it was caught on video from a nearby security camera. That will play a role in just a second, but you can see in the video, he actually racks the pistol. He inserts a round into the chamber of the weapon as he's chasing after them and threatening to shoot them. So they drop their purses, the guy takes them, and then he drives away. He ends up going to a nearby gas station and using the cards to buy things. The police then traced the transactions from the cards to those stations and then obtained the surveillance footage from them to get a picture of the guy's face, and then they aired that on the local news. And guess who called in to identify the man that almost killed my mom? None other than his parole officer. This guy had other charges for home invasion, stealing multiple weapons, parole violation, but you don't understand. It's because uh, systemic racism or whatever that he does this, right? Never mind that this pork son of a bitch weighs like 300 pounds. He pulls up in a luxury sedan. So he's not exactly like missing meals or experiencing a terrible standard of living. No, the left tells us this only happens because of things that happened and no longer happen because they stopped happening decades before most of us were even born. But regardless... Here's the update. She gets a letter in the mail from the office of the prosecuting attorney. It reads, Dear John Doyle's mom, although you may have already heard, I'm sending this letter to make certain that you are aware that in the case of People v. Fat Albert, the case against the defendant was dismissed by court on December 13th, 2019 by judge, insert judge name here. And the reason that I'm leaving out names and specific details is because I don't want these people to be harassed by anybody that sees this video, but I still think that it's important to talk about. But it goes on to say, the burden of proving a criminal case beyond a reasonable doubt is not an easy one. Sometimes the evidence is insufficient, or there are other legal reasons why a case does not proceed to trial and conviction. We would like to thank you for all of your help on this case. Without the help of citizens like yourself, our criminal justice system in this office could not function. If you have any questions regarding this case, please contact our office at blah blah blah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, are you guys defective remember how much you guys had so much publicly available evidence that I was able to include footage of the incident in a video which was then seen by thousands of people now I know that proving beyond a reasonable doubt can be tricky not when you have it on camera that's sort of the whole gimmick of security cameras right like this document is one of the biggest FUs that I have ever seen from the legal system because it is literally saying now, ma'am, I know that this man is alleged to have robbed you, or so you claim, and I know that we even have footage of the event which completely aligns with your story, and I know that the cards which you claim were stolen were then allegedly found to be used at a gas station by the same man who allegedly robbed you, but you have to understand... Beyond reasonable doubt is tricky, ma'am. Maybe the twin brother of the man who robbed you heard about the story and beat him up, and then he went to return the cards to you, but he stopped at a nearby gas station to buy you some snacks with your own money for all your troubles. Ma'am! We just can never be too sure with these things, but thank you for everything that you've done to help us. We can assure you that while your robber will be released, we will continue to pay ourselves six-figure salaries with your tax dollars. Mm, I'm gonna do it, man. I'm gonna go Joker mode. I'm gonna walk in to the office. Sir, can I help you? I just want my phone call. This is such an absolute joke. I guess the office of the prosecuting attorney dropped the ball on it, which then forced the judge to dismiss the case, and it's like, I'm just astonished, you know? And this is why I'm making the video, because people that pretend, oh, police are racist against black people. The legal system is racist against black people. I can promise you that the legal system is too stupid and incompetent to even do its job correctly, let alone do it so well and efficiently that they have the time to be like, Jim, let's target the blacks today. It's just such a joke. And it's funny, too. 
like it's a lie. It's just such a lie because it assumes that only racist white people are occupying law enforcement and the justice system, which is not true. For example, here's a picture of the prosecuting attorney that hecked up my mom's case so spectacularly. And now here is a picture of the judge that dismissed the case. I'm drawing no conclusions, much to consider. And we'll go through all of the arguments and debunk them because this is such a demonstrable and dangerous lie. It is not true. And the left doesn't like these stories being told because it goes against their narrative. So we're going to have to be the ones to do it. And speaking of that, um, we're going to be doing a live interview with a young woman that I met at a speech in Akron who was experiencing symptoms of gender dysphoria when she was younger um, and then was pressured into transitioning by counselors and doctors. And so it's going to be really interesting. And these are the stories that the left pretends don't exist. They try and shut these down. So as of right now, we're going to do that on the website Tuesday, February 25th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time for members only. But if we can get enough people signed up before then, then we'll just do it here live for everybody to see. So if you're already signed up, like my good friend, William, my good friend, Raymond, my absolute pal, Jonathan, then you're good to go. But if you're not, and you're interested in seeing that, plus everything else that we have up on the website that's very epic, please consider signing up. If we can get enough people signed up, I'll just do it here for everybody to see. That would be epic. You know, if we could get like a couple hundred people signed up for a few bucks a month, that would be epic. I would never have to talk about it again, and we could just keep sticking it to YouTube. But yeah. So that's that. So now we'll get into the arguments. But I do have to preface by saying that there are lots of factors that play into this issue. There are discrepancies between blacks and whites within the justice system, obviously. But we're just focused on race right now because the argument from the left is that this happens because of racism. So we're here to say, no, that's not true. All of the other factors that play into these outcomes are for a separate discussion. Right now, we're just focused on the supposed racism that's causing these things that we're about to go over. A lot of these arguments aren't really even arguments, like with gun control or abortion, there are like arguments, but these are just like facts that are either misrepresented or untrue, and those feel broader talking points, so that's what we're going to focus on, and they all basically fall into one of the categories that we're going to go through, so just because we don't go through the exact figure from one source doesn't mean that we haven't refuted the conclusion to which it was alluding, so um, I want to start first by talking about Black Lives Matter. I believe that most of the people in this movement are acting in good faith, but that doesn't negate the fact that this movement was built upon a foundation of lies. On their website, you can read their history and find out that they started after George Zimmerman was acquitted for shooting Trayvon Martin, and they described George Zimmerman as a, quote, white passing person. Why they didn't describe him as, like, what he is, which is a Latino, like, I don't know, because maybe they need the narrative to be blacks versus whites. Maybe that's why the media called him white and then changed it to mixed race and then finally to white Hispanic, whatever that means. And then Black Lives Matter uses this to say that they wanted to make sure that Zimmerman and his, quote, fellow white supremacists didn't get the last word in the media. George Zimmerman, the Latino white supremacist. It's like that uh, Dave Chappelle skit. From the Chappelle show. Um, and I do have to clarify that I don't think that George Zimmerman is an outstandingly good human being. He keeps coming up in the news every year or so for different things, and it just sort of makes me skeptical. But in this particular case, with the shooting of Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman was entirely justified to stand his ground. And there's a lot of details to this case. And the last two Februaries, I've been to make a video about it because people always go on Twitter like, Trayvon Martin would have been this many years old today if it wasn't for America being racist. But actually, that no, that's his birthday. But the date of the shooting, that was still on February, too. So we we might actually get it out this time. Who knows? Um, but anyways, just a quick summary of what happened. Trayvon Martin was staying with his dad and his dad's fiance while he was out of school due to being suspended for the third time, this time for having drug paraphernalia and a bag with marijuana residue at school. Six months earlier, the neighborhood had established a neighborhood watch because of repeated break-ins, and George Zimmerman was named the coordinator of this program. So then on February 26, 2012, Zimmerman reported uh, there was a young man peering into windows of homes in the community who appeared to be on drugs, and THC was later found in Martin's system during the autopsy. So the police dispatcher instructed Zimmerman not to follow Trayvon. Now, Zimmerman later said that he obeyed the dispatcher and that Martin confronted him and then punched him in the face, but Zimmerman had also said that he walked in the direction of Trayvon while trying to establish a precise location. But witness testimony and physical evidence showed that Trayvon had straddled Zimmerman and pounded his head into the pavement. So then uh, Zimmerman shot Trayvon in the chest and then an officer arrived and he found Trayvon dead and Zimmerman on the ground bleeding from multiple wounds through the head and the face. So Zimmerman was charged with second degree murder on April 11th, 2012. Uh, and the defense could have used Florida standard ground law, but they didn't. Instead, they argued that Zimmerman shot Trayvon in self-defense and then an all-female jury acquitted him in July of 2013. And so then there were talks of hate crime charges, but the DOJ could find no evidence of a race-based killing by Zimmerman. 
There was no evidence that he acted unlawfully in any way. And even if he were following Trayvon, that doesn't excuse Trayvon's actions. Like, interesting now that the left decides that blaming the victim is okay, right? Like, that shooting was not an example of racism. It was an example of self-defense. But this is the incident that sparked the Black Lives Matter movement. And we're reminded of it every year as the example of American racism and white supremacy. And they've, all, they've also got stuff on there about Mike Brown and how uh, they protested that shooting. Remember, hands up, don't shoot. That phrase was made popular by the Black Lives Matter activists, despite the fact that it is based on a lie. The Department of Justice released their report of the investigation, and it found that physical and forensic evidence contradicted witnesses who claimed that Brown had his hands up when Wilson shot him. It also stated that witnesses whose testimony aligned with the physical and forensic evidence never, quote, perceived Brown to be attempting to surrender at any point when Wilson fired upon him. The report concluded there was no justification for a federal prosecution of Officer Wilson. Michael Brown was a thug who attacked a police officer. There's nothing else more to say about it. Hands up, don't shoot is a lie. It's a stupid lie. Even the Washington Post fact checker gave it four Pinocchios. Hands up, don't shoot was literally proven to be body angled downward as I charge a police officer who I just assaulted while he draws his weapon and begs me to stop. But you know, that doesn't fit on t-shirts as well, so there's that. But you know, as we go through these, I do have to say the proof is really in the pudding because Black Lives Matter, the movement, that brings attention to the alleged racism experienced by black Americans at the hands of police and the justice system. The examples cited by the biggest activist group for this cause as the reasons which compelled them to come together, those were all completely justifiable. And this transitions into the most common one that we hear, which is that uh, police are killing black people. Police are killing unarmed black people. It's an epidemic. It happens all the time. No, it really doesn't happen all the time. The media just covers the hell out of it when it does happen so that they can profit off your hysteria. In 2016, there were 16 unarmed black men killed by police, down from 36 the previous year. And remember, that's out of 20 million black men. And we could go through all those cases, probably find areas where the officer went wrong, probably find some areas where the suspect went wrong. But to pretend that they're all invariably motivated by racism is just absolute nonsense. Like, we actually know that white officers are not more likely to shoot minority suspects. White police officers actually kill black and other minority suspects at lower rates than we would expect if killings were randomly distributed amongst officers of all races. And minority officers are actually more likely to shoot minority suspects. And through studies of actual police killings, as well as prior laboratory experiments involving officer shoot, don't shoot trials, there's no compelling evidence that racism drives the killing of black suspects. The reason more are killed by white cops is purely because the plurality of officers involved is white because of simple demographic numbers like in the police force. And we also know that the vast majority of people killed by police are armed at the time of their fatal encounter. More than two thirds of them are in possession of a gun. And like, I'm not a huge fan of police. I do like police generally. I don't know, like I'm somewhere between, officer, am I being detained? And like, sir, yes, sir, you may disarm me if it helps you protect and serve me, sir, you know? Or maybe like a kid on a skateboard, you know, where the cop walks over and is just like, hey man, you know, that was actually a cool trick. It's just like, Fuck you, dude. You just like take off on the skateboard. Something like that, somewhere in between. I'm skeptical of authority and because of that, I know that all I have to do to minimize the amount of time I have to spend talking to police, just be polite, follow their instructions. It's really not that difficult. But another thing that's spread around is this idea that blacks are constantly harassed by police. Um, and this is what leads them to having higher crime rates. And this is also just not true. And the best data for this is aggregated by the Police Public Contact Survey, which provides detailed information about contacts between police and the public. And it's conducted by the Bureau of Justice Statistics as a supplement to the National Crime Victimization Survey based on a nationally uh, representative sample of residents age 16 and older, and it aims to basically collect data directly from the population instead of relying on data provided by law enforcement agencies. So people are asked whether they had contact with the police during the last 12 months, and if they did, they have to answer questions about the nature of their interaction with the police during that last contact, uh, specifically questions about whether the police used or threatened to use force during the contact, and if so, what they did, what they threatened to do, stuff like that. Um, and since the respondents are also asked questions about their age, race, gender, stuff like that, it makes it possible to calculate the prevalence of police violence for various demographic groups. Also, since it's entirely based on what respondents say and it doesn't rely on police reports, it eliminates the possibility of bias from law enforcement agencies, which may be incentivized to misrepresent their numbers. So the narrative is that police are always stopping black people for no reason, uh, sometimes dozens of times a year, and that's just not true. Among men, only 20.7% of whites, 17.5% of blacks, and 17.1% of Hispanics have at least one contact with the police in any given year. White people are actually more likely to have contact with the police than black or Hispanic people, which kind of goes against the narrative. And you might say, well, this is because white people just get a kick out of calling the police. But 
If you look at the average number of contacts with police per year, it's still extremely close. And then if you look at the amount of people who have three or more contacts with police, the numbers are still pretty close, but blacks are a bit higher. But this could be better explained by blacks living in urban areas and committing more violent crimes than this boogeyman of institutional racism that we hear about. You know, if it were racism, you'd expect the margins to be a lot bigger, but they aren't. Same thing with the numbers who were met with verbal force or threatened with physical force or who were met with physical force. It can be much better explained by their greater likelihood of being arrested for violent crimes than some speculative conclusion about racism being the primary cause. And there's also this idea of uh, driving while black, that police are stopping black people all the time for absolutely no reason other than that they are black. And this is not true. We've done studies of police stops that measured stops during the day with those made at night operating under the theory that if police officers were profiling, there should be more stops of black and Latino motorists during daytime hours when race would be more discernible, which would make sense because it's a lot harder to see who's actually operating the vehicle at night. Um, and the studies have found no significant discrepancies. So this could probably be better explained by different behaviors that blacks and Hispanics have when driving. For example, a study of alleged racial profiling in New Jersey found no such bias amongst uh, New Jersey police officers. Instead, it actually found that black motorists were more likely to drive above the speed limit. And there was a study of drivers in North Carolina that arrived at a similar conclusion. Blacks are also less likely to wear seatbelts. And there's no evidence that police are more likely to selectively enforce this on blacks. In fact, the evidence suggests that they're actually more likely to enforce it on whites. Blacks are also twice as likely to speed as whites. Studies on high school age students have shown that blacks and Hispanics are much more likely to practice dist uh, distracted driving and other risky driving patterns than whites are. We've got data of non-DUI fatal accidents that show when controlled for population and distance driven that blacks and Hispanics are involved in more fatal accidents than whites. And we've also got data that show controlled for miles traveled uh, that blacks and Hispanics cause more fatal DUI crashes than whites as well in all age groups, except for one, which is that whites between 16 and 20 cause more uh, than Hispanics between 16 and 20, but it's by a very slim margin. So could all of those factors maybe be why they're more likely to be pulled over? Like seriously, I'm asking, like, what are we going to go with here? That they're more likely to demonstrate behavior that causes police to pull people over or racism? Like which one? And again, we can talk about why these behaviors are different. I'm sure it would be an enlightened conversation, but to completely ignore the differences in behavior and just cry racism is just idiotic. And it's not a real attempt at solving the problem. That's funny. It's like you first get into politics, you're like, bro, debate me on the wage gap. But then you get in a bit deeper. You start to get to a point where it's like, bro, debate me on the legal implications of seatbelt usage discrepancies between racial minorities. It's like that. That's funny. That's where we're at now. But they also say that mandatory minimum sentences for crack are racist since the threshold is lower than for cocaine. And since blacks are more likely to use crack and whites are more likely to use cocaine, uh, this is evidence of racism. The reality is that crack is much cheaper than cocaine because it's made from cocaine and baking soda and water. And it's still extremely addicting. And since it's cheaper and you can make so much of it and then sell it quickly for relatively low prices and still turn a big profit, it has a much more harmful effect on communities than cocaine. And since it's such a lucrative business, it causes competition. And... Rival drug operations don't really compete like us free marketeers do, you know, with a with a good product at a fair price. No, they just kill each other. It's very ugly. So that's the reason behind it. And since it's cheaper and extremely addictive, it's had a big effect on densely populated low income areas, many of which are occupied by black Americans. So people have decided that it's racist. Here's the thing. In order to get the mandatory minimum sentence, you have to be in possession of 28 grams of crack. That's roughly an ounce of crack, which means that's about $4,500 worth of crack. That's a fair amount of crack, you know, and keep in mind that it's usually sold in what are called rocks, which are one tenth of a gram or uh, one quarter gram baggy. So someone that's getting the mandatory minimum uh, was in possession of about 280 rocks worth of crack. That doesn't exactly expel victim of addiction or harmless user to me. That seems more like someone profiting off the destruction of his community. So enforcing laws that apply equally to everyone is not racist. And, you know, we've also got the, well, our prisons are filled with nonviolent drug offenders. People are going to prison for just possessing marijuana. And this is racist because these people are disproportionately black. This is just not true. This is deliberately misleading. And sometimes even people on the right will buy into this. You know, you get some of these libertarian types yelling about my freedom and it's just not true you know there's a few parts to this but the most obvious response would be that even if what you're claiming is true that these people are going to jail for smoking pot for possessing it for you know these non-violent drug offenses that's the most common phrase that we're hearing now even if that were true it still would not be racist because that system would not be guaranteed to affect only black Americans or non-white Americans. It's not like when we had actually racist policies in this country. It's not like when we had Jim Crow, where if you were black, you weren't allowed to enter the store, but everyone else could. This just, again, assuming it's correct, 
hey, don't have or use these drugs. And for whatever reason, black and other non-white Americans still do at a disproportionate rate. So maybe they go to jail for it, along with some white Americans. Like, is that still racist? How can a law be racist if it affects all races and the degree to which it affects those races is entirely dependent on the people of that race and how they choose to behave? It's like, and what's important to note about the language surrounding this issue is that it's basically used interchangeably. So we'll hear smoking pot, possessing marijuana, nonviolent drug offender, all like within the same monologue as if those are all different facets of one experience, but that's simply not the case. And so, you know, we hear talk about people smoking pot. We sort of render this image of a guy that's just smoking by himself. He's not really bothering anybody. And then from there, we hear possession of marijuana and we don't really see too much of a difference between those. And then with nonviolent drug offender, we still basically defer to this sort of harmless stoner stereotype that's in our minds without understanding what is technically classified as a nonviolent drug offender. The law breaks it down pretty well. Speaking broadly about drugs, we have charges for possession of small amounts and the penalties for this, depending on where you live, are anywhere from minor to non-existent. This is because we generally understand that it's best to help people overcome their addictions or you know, perhaps prevent them from becoming addicted rather than to punish them. Like we want to get them help, we want to educate them and hopefully they can go on to live a drug-free lifestyle. Now, conversely, if you're in possession of a large amount, which clearly shows that you are involved in the manufacturing, cultivation or distribution of that drug. Well, now this is much more serious because you're trafficking. You are a threat to the community. You destroy lives. And I'm not taking a stance right now on the war on drugs. I'm just explaining the idea behind our laws. And all of that aside, it's not true that our prisons are full of these nonviolent drug offenders. You know, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez think that people are going to prison for possessing dime bags, and that's just not true. You see, when one goes to prison, one is classified by the highest offense for which they were convicted. So if someone's arrested for a violent crime but ends up pleading guilty to a drug charge, his crime is classified as a nonviolent drug offense, even if the underlying incident, like a domestic violence case in which the victim won't testify, is the reason that the prosecutor sought prison time. These types of deals happen all of the time. It's extremely common. The Bureau of Justice says that at least 55% of people in prison have been convicted of a violent crime. And more than half of them, about 30% of the total population, have been convicted of murder, manslaughter, rape, or sexual assault. Narratives like this are the reason that Americans think that 50% of the people in prison are just there for drug charges, when really it's about 15% at the state level and a larger part of the federal level, but the federal level is only like 10% of the total prison population. The people that get locked up for marijuana are either committing the offense while on probation or parole. They're charged with a more serious crime, but then they plead guilty to the lesser offense of marijuana possession, but then as a part of that plea bargain, they're still required to serve a prison sentence. Uh, they've got a criminal history, particularly involving drugs and or violent crime. The violation took place in a designated drug-free zone, like on school property, or the marijuana sentence piggybacks the sentence for one or more other serious offenses. Like that's it. That's the truth behind these talking points from the left. And the left can get away with this narrative because only the prosecutor and defense attorney will ever see the entire rap sheet. But you can talk to any lawyer. They will tell you that this is the case. Happens all the time. And that brings us to the next one that we hear all the time, which is that black people are arrested for drugs more than white people despite similar usage rate. So the idea here is, hey, if white people and black people are using drugs at about the same rate, why is it that black people get arrested for it more often? Well, as we talked about, no one's getting locked up for possessing marijuana. There are almost invariably other charges an extensive criminal record, evidence of intent to distribute, etc. And since we know that black Americans are more likely to commit virtually every violent crime than white Americans, we know that black Americans are more likely to have criminal records. We know that one in three black men, for example, have a felony conviction on their record. So these are all things that are being considered when they're being tried. But of course, they'll just say, well, that's only because the justice system is racist. And even ignoring that that is entirely based on speculation, right? Like, you know, we look at these discrepancies and we're like, hey, do you ever notice how there's more black Americans with felonies than white Americans? Uh, do you think that this has anything to do with the fact that they commit more violent crimes? And they're just like, nah, no, no. It's, it's, it's like racism or whatever, right? It's like, who cares about evidence? And again, I have to say, we can talk about why that is. We can have that conversation. We can talk about the factors that have affected the black community, whether it's redlining or single mothers, but ultimately it's the individual's responsibility to avoid participating in negative and harmful behavior. So holding that expectation for them, as we do for everyone else, is not racist. And as far as them just being arrested for it, black Americans tend to live in densely populated urban areas, which require more police officers and a smaller radius since there's more people. And these areas also tend to be more dangerous uh, which again requires more police and a smaller radius. This isn't because they're black, it's because there's a lot of them living close to each other 
in areas that have more criminal activity. This has nothing to do with racism. And moving on, uh, we have this idea that blacks get higher sentences than whites for the same crimes. We've already discussed why this is likely for drug crimes. Um, and for all of this in general, just keep in mind that we have evidence that would explain these things. Like, you know, we would expect that people that behave this way probably have more problems with law enforcement, right? Could that be why? No, just, just, just racism? Do you have evidence? Just a hunch? Like, okay. And you know, there's a lot of different figures that they cite for this particular argument, uh, but they're all derived from bad data. And here's why. They're either not controlling for the equivalent crimes, only looking at sentencing without the actual likelihood of incarceration, only looking at the federal system, which makes up a small percentage of the total system, uh, referring to youth sentencing or using outdated numbers. In all cases, when you adjust the methodology for those factors, the discrepancies virtually cease to exist. So it turns out that you can actually fix racism by just being better at statistics. Uh, another one, black Americans are more likely than white Americans to be arrested. Once arrested, they are more likely to be convicted. And once convicted, they are more likely to experience lengthy prison sentences. Okay, very epic. Black Americans are more likely to be arrested because they are more likely to commit crimes and live in densely populated areas, which naturally have a higher police presence. Boom, roasted. They're more likely to be convicted. Not true if you take into account the individual crimes for which they're being charged and their criminal records. Boom, roasted. And they're more likely to serve lengthy sentences. Also not true when you take into account the individual crimes for which they are being charged and their criminal records. Boom. Roasted. Racism has been defeated yet again. Sorry, libs. Uh, they say that predictive policing is racist. For those of you not familiar, predictive policing is the practice of using analytical models to help prevent crime. And since these models tend to point towards minority neighborhoods, they conclude that they must be racist. First problem, an algorithm can't be racist because it's just math. Second problem, the only way that you could think a program designed to prevent crime is racist towards minorities is if you think that minorities cannot stop themselves from committing crimes or that it's an inseparable component of their culture. I don't believe that. I think that there's a lot of factors that contribute to it, and I have to keep stressing that because otherwise people are going to think that I'm approaching this in bad faith, which I am not. But the way that I see it is that in most of these urban areas, you've got somewhere around like three or five blocks where the majority of the crime is coming from, and that negatively affects everyone else. So why not use an analytical model to allocate your resources better to help the community, right? Like oftentimes these departments don't have the funding necessary to cover the entire geography. So yeah, why not have them just focus on these areas which have historically been the most predisposed to crime? Like it's not racist. It's just people using technology to try to keep their communities safe from the few people who are making it unsafe. And the last one, that SWAT team raids disproportionately target black neighborhoods. This complaint is like literally that SWAT teams raid black neighborhoods more often than white neighborhoods and 62% of the time it's because of drugs and this is racist because we all know that blacks and drugs go together like peas and carrots. Enforcing laws that apply equally to everyone is not racist. Like maybe you should focus less energy on yelling at police for trying to protect the black community and more energy trying to help the black community with issues which it currently faces. And you know, in my opinion, I'm not a member of the black community, so I'm not purporting this to be exactly correct, but it would be something like the epidemic of fatherlessness in homes. That's literally it. If the family unit were repaired, I cannot think of any issue which would not decrease in severity or prevalence. Like maybe we'll talk about that in another video, but I'm not kidding. You look at the kids growing up in these low income areas with lots of gang activity. If they're living with both of their parents, their likelihood of participating in risky behavior hits the floor. It vanishes, relatively speaking. So yeah. Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, and of course, subscribe to the channel because this is actually a series that we do. Every now and then we, we go through these arguments and we refute them all. Um, and so if you like that, you're gonna wanna be subscribed so you can get the next one, maybe go to the channel, see the other ones that we've done. It's all pretty epic. Lots of words. Kind of a sore throat now, but uh, you know, it's all part of the job, all part of a hard day's work owning the libs. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't give it up for the world. Maybe if Bloomberg pays me off. I wonder what my price would be. Just kidding, never selling out. Thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.